My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. Got other people make friends. I'm just trying to make you a little money. My job, not just to entertain, but to explain. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC. Tweet me at Jim Kramer. Maybe what we need to do here, I'm thinking, is to have a patented scare list so you'll be prepared the next time the experts try to frighten you out of the stock market. Sell, sell, sell. That's how I feel after the market cascaded lower yesterday. On the rebound, fabulous today. Dow advancing 152 points, S&P gaining 0.96%, but the Nasdaq climbing 1.30%, crushing the hopes of short sellers everywhere. <laughs> Putting a K-bosh to the doomsayers and the alarmists. Now, there's a rhythm to our business. When things are going well, we hear from people who are doing fine and like the market. When things are going badly, we're treated with a parade of pessimists who seem convinced that every downturn is a repeat of the Great Recession or the dot-com crash or even the Great Depression. <laughs> All right, I listen to them all. Nothing wrong with testing your thesis, but I recognize some of these people are really good at being dramatic. Hey, they should be on like a Netflix show called The Skies on Fire. So I have an idea. I got to prepare for this stuff to happen again. So I want to give you the top five scares of this market right now because they're deployed strategically to keep you out of stocks. And you need to recognize when that's happening and you can parry them with confidence. Now, the first and finest, most ubiquitous scare. Oh, the coming collapse of commercial real estate and the banks that are hung by it. We're told commercial real estate is a trillion-dollar debacle that could cause a series of bank failures that pulverize the entire stock market. I know there are plenty of commercial buildings out there that really aren't worth anything, dead or alive. They're too old to fit into this era of rapid digitization, so no use keeping them alive. But they're not worth anything dead either because they're too expensive to convert to residential real estate or the cost of knocking them down is just exorbitant. They are indeed zombie buildings, and their owners have a real problem, and increasingly they are walking away from them. True. But who are the owners? Now, I, I thought it might be the real estate investment trust. I looked at some of the so-called worst ones, like uh, Vernado or, or, or uh, SL Green, I mean, which I've told repeatedly are dead men walking. And all I can say is, pass me the dead meat, please. This SL Green, a big New York City commercial real estate player that everyone told me was just going to die, is just crushing it. Now, I know uh, many banks are on the hook, but the large ones have already written these things down almost next, maybe next to nothing. The minor banks, sure, they're going to get hurt if things keep going badly. But other than New York Community Bank Corp, which was allowed to double down when it bought the failed signature bank by the Fed, no less, I don't see a lot of zombie fellow travelers. I, insurers own a lot of zombie buildings. So, uh, they've got a lot of mortgages, but rates are flying high. And they're all pretty well capitalized for any problems in the portfolio. So count me out for uh, in the these guys are all going to get brought down by this. Besides, you know what? The whole commercial real estate catastrophe thesis goes out the window once more businesses get aggressive about pushing people to show up at work. And I am telling you, it is happening and happening all over the country. Second scare. The Fed's next move might not come soon enough to save us. Right, this one has a powerful impact because you can get days like yesterday where a host of seemingly smart people do their absolute best to scare you out of your wits when we get a spike in one line of the CPI report, in this case, rents. Of course, they'd say that scare you out isn't their intent. <laughs> but if they aren't trying to scare you out, why the heck are they always so darn dramatic? Why try to win the Academy Award for Best Bear in a cable news drama? No, no. <laughs> Honestly, I don't want to hear any of these Fed-related worries because we're really in what's historically the best period to own stocks, the time between the moment when the Fed stops raising rates and the moment when the Fed starts cutting rates. The bears aren't worried about looking like idiots, though. See, uh, when they're wrong, nobody really cares because then they just say, look, we were just trying to be careful. I say thanks for rien, which is French for nothing. Third scare, we got two markets, the best the best. And, you know, I'm talking there about the Super Six. And then the Raggedy Rest, the other 494 members of the S&P 500. The best of the Raggedy Rest. What do you think of that? What's the rap here? We're told you can't buy a narrow market. It's a sign of danger, danger, danger. To which I say, well, what are you supposed to do if the market actually broadens out? I guess you can go in and buy stocks after everything's moved up from the broadening. But you know what? I'm more of a kind of buy low, sell high kind of guy. Fourth scare. 
the coming earnings collapse. Oh, you need to go back in time before earnings season began to read about how earnings were supposed to be horrendous this quarter. Forecasts even worse. I think I can count on one hand the stocks that actually did truly disappoint so far in earnings and forecasts. On any given day, you might have had upwards of 10 stocks that delivered fantastic quarters. Even companies that reported disappointing numbers often saw their stocks rally the next day. Hey, Lattice Semiconductor, what a stinker, right? I mean, terrible conference call, too. Gave you a miserable forecast. But bingo, the stock's up five bucks since then. That would have been a bad sale. Finally, there is the fifth scare, and it's one I take very personally, frankly. I take it to heart, even. It's the amazing rise of the stock of NVIDIA. Now I listen to people. By the way, I didn't know who NVIDIA was for the last, like, three years. Suddenly, they're, like, two years. Now they're on board. Now they know about NVIDIA. And they're treating the stock's ascendance as if it's some sort of freak show. Oh, we passed Amazon. That's not It's rivaling Alphabet. Oh, no, it's well ahead of Meta and Tesla. Woo, scary. You almost never hear that maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, that NVIDIA, darn it, deserves the accolades. Never mind that they invented the chips that power artificial intelligence, something that could potentially transform the entire economy down the road. Now, I was talking to a very nice viewer. I, I talk to people. I mean, I, that makes me a little different from a lot of people on TV. I actually talk to people. I mean, like regular people. I called this woman on her 60th wedding anniversary to wish her happy anniversary. I threw in a happy Valentine's Day, too, because I'm a gent. And you know what she said to me? She remembered buying shares in NVIDIA back in 2017 when it was in the 40s. She bought it. Why? Okay, it was because I did this big analysis of the artificial intelligence. No, it's because I named my rescue mutt NVIDIA. And he actually answered to it, provided, of course, I had a nice T-bone in my hand. She said no one would name their dog after a stock if they didn't believe in the stock. And she believed in me, so therefore she bought NVIDIA. But, man, when I pounded the table in NVIDIA in 2017, I was hounded for recommending what looked like an insanely expensive stock. Kramer had lost his mind. People couldn't believe it. Darn things seemed to be selling for 100 times earnings. Of course, in retrospect, NVIDIA turned out to be selling for far less than the average stock in the S&P 500 because the actual earnings came in much higher than the forecast. Hey, but, oh, but I should tell you this. The nice caller also has a male cat named Amazon and a female cat named Apple, and they're doing well, too. I reiterated the, the NVIDIA buy endlessly here to the point where people are really sick of it. And my staff was sick of it. I'm looking at my staff like, yeah, yeah, NVIDIA. Yeah, there it is. I mean, like, if you could, my executive producer says it's an incredible Valentine's Day uh, outfit. Can we, like, do we have any lights there? And she's like, yeah, enough, enough with the darn thing. She's like, go ahead, make the face that you just did when I mentioned NVIDIA. Go ahead, do it, do it. Just, can you turn this? You got to turn the camera. It's like, you got to go like, what did I? What, what face did you give me when I mentioned Nvidia? What'd you do? <laughs> yeah, there. See, that's what I'm talking about. Me? I'm talking about Wonderman. What is she talking about? That's the. That's what I get all the time. Now I know we don't buy stocks around here because they can power robot dogs to pick up Jello cubes and then reward the successful ones with treats. They have a sense of humor in NVIDIA. I saw that. I know you shouldn't recommend a stock simply because you spoke to a computer at NVIDIA headquarters, asked it to paint a seascape by Cezanne, thinking you could, you know, kind of fool it because Cezanne, he was really, more, really much more into still lifes. Instead, it used the same colors, the brush strokes of Cezanne nailed when he painted that fable apples and oranges with a touch of the card players thrown in. When I saw that dynamite Cezanne seascape, I knew it was the future. So I wasn't going to just say, hey, stick to Intel. Yet, I bet the vast majority of people who mocked me for pounding the table because I saw a seascape made by Cezanne did precisely that. So it's easy to scare people. And if you're a short seller, it's also profitable. You won't be called out on being wrong. You'll just be called on again the next time the market looks down or is down because you got something to say. But the bottom line, all I ask is that when those professional bears come on, could they just remember that this is not the day after Pearl Harbor, which, by the way, was a pretty dark day for the country, or the day when Lehman went under, or maybe when Fannie and Freddie rolled over? It's just business as usual. No need to pretend that the sky is falling or to yawn and mock me when I say to buy NVIDIA. Whole staff is yawning. <laughs> All right, let's go, to, let's go to Jerry in Illinois, please. Jerry. And a good day to you, Mr. Kramer. Sure, uh, how you been? I'm a recovering vet uh, with some wounds, and that's how oh. I discovered your, your your show. I'm well, just hooked. It's an amazing show. Oh, thanks, Jerry, and I hope that, you know, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> Thank that. Thank you, sir. 
We try. You know, we try to put some humor in it, too, you know, Jer? And I'm thinking that, like, it's so odd to have, like, a kind of, it's, look, it's not like I'm Leno or Letterman or Carson or Fallon, but, you know, it's good to have some live, you know, some upbeat stuff, don't you think? I, you're correct. I Thank tell you. people I just had a bad day at the workplace, but... I, I'm going to be okay, but thank, thank you. you for asking. And thank you for everything you've done, okay? Thank you for thank everything you, you've done. Sir, I have a question. Again, I, I'm just fascinated with your show. Uh, want to invest in Uber? Mm -hmm. I think it's a good start for me. Would you concur? Yes, totally. Now, look, this stock... Uh, has had a run. But you know what? I am a huge believer in ride share. Even Lyft had a good number today. I think ride share is the future. I think, Jerry, this is a good level. I put on half a position now, and then I'd buy more if it came down because it's, it's been up a lot. But I like your thing. But more important, I like what you did for our country. All right? All right. It is easy to scare people out of the market, especially after days like yesterday. But you got to remember that the sky isn't falling. And right now, it's still just business as usual. And if you want to laugh at me for liking NVIDIA, be my guest. Well, man, buddy, tonight, GenRack is seeing a shift in the way people are living in a post-COVID world. I'm finding out what it is and how it could impact your investing thesis with the CEO. Then Airbnb's quarter gave us some hope about the strength of the travel sector. But I, I, do I still feel confident in the strength of the company itself? I'm running through the numbers to give you my take. And Cisco reported after the bell. I'm going to go straight to the source for details because it's looking a little light after the close. Do not miss my exclusive with the CEO, Chuck Robbins. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com. Or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.